Um, I'll just let you get started, Stephen, and take it away. And I'll I'll keep an eye on the chat, and I'll answer whatever questions I can, like within the chat. And then if you've got time at some point, you know, we could take a couple questions, probably. Yeah, totally. I'm also cool if you want to pause me and ask clarifying questions um, as I go. So okay, yeah. If there's something that I think like really needs it will do that otherwise let's uh we can just kind of like cruise and we will take a break at um wait, one about like one o'clock ish one fifty like around 105 110 um mm. and the class wait no i'm sorry it's yeah. one o'clock now <laughs> two o'clock i i should pre 145 we'll take our break at 145 and um uh, I can just hop on and, and like at a good stopping point, just interrupt you, I think real quick, just let you know, unless you want to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, I can, I can do that too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Between the two of us, we'll make it work. Indeed. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Karya. And yeah. thanks all of you for being here. I'm super excited to be a part of this class, The Story of Pittsburgh's Forests, um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how fungi shape our forests. So as Karia said, my name's Stephen. I'm a naturalist at the Parks Conservancy and the current president of the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. And my background is in ecology. Um, I have zero formal training in mycology. I'm just putting that out there at the start here. Everything that I'm presenting today is stuff that I've learned um, just by researching during my, during my free time, pretty much. Um, I did get to take a plant pathology class during um, my undergraduate studies. I went to Penn State Erie. And um, that was a really fun class, learning about um, all different kinds of fungi and bacteria that can impact the health of plants. But that's the only like formal um, class or training I've had related to mycology. Um, yeah. So I wanted to start kind of at the beginning here. What are fungi? So there's this really awesome visualization I found of the tree of life, so the evolution of life here on Earth um, that can show some of the relationships between different organisms. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms, so they have a nucleus, and they also have cell walls. But unlike plants, fungi cell walls are composed primarily of chitin. Um, it's the same material found in insect exoskeletons. Um, so they're eukaryotic organisms with cell walls composed primarily of chitin who are heterotrophs, which means they don't produce their own food like plants. They get their nutrients from their environment um, by excreting enzymes and acids into their surroundings uh, to turn whatever it is they're eating into um, its fundamental components so that, so that they can absorb those molecules and, and get what they need to live. So they're a lot like animals. Um, we have to eat stuff to get energy and, and minerals and, and other nutrients to survive. Fungi have to eat stuff too. Um, they just do their eating on the outside of their bodies um, rather than ingesting and then digesting. They digest and then absorb those nutrients. Um, so fungi play critical roles in ecosystems, which we're going to be exploring today. They're involved in the decomposition of 90% of the organic material on Earth. Um, that's terrestrial and marine. So a lot of people, when they think about fungi, think about um, terrestrial fungi, but there are marine and aquatic fungi as well. So here's another representation of the evolutionary relationships between some of the different eukaryotic organisms. 
And I wanted to show this to highlight um, just how closely related fungi and animals really are. Um, the traditional taxonomic view here uh, of, of dividing life up into the seven kingdoms, or originally it was the five kingdoms, um, you know, animals, plants, and fungi were three of those kingdoms, uh, depending on what system you were looking at. Um, there's still a lot of debate about how to divide life up once you get to those higher taxonomic levels, like on the, on the kingdom level. Uh, one of the proposed kingdoms, I think there's a new system proposed that has like nine kingdoms or something like that. And one of the proposed kingdoms is Opistocanti or something like that. Um, this word here, the Opistocons, um, which would place fungi and animals within the same kingdom of life. Um, so I just think that's kind of cool that we're pretty closely related to fungi. So closely related, in fact, that people can sometimes have really strange allergic reactions to fungi. Uh, I was just reading about that recently um, because of how closely we're related to them. So yeah, you've got green plants up here. And I know this text is really small. Um, <laughs> it might be kind of hard to read, but up at the top here is green plants. Um, some other plant-like organisms branching off here. This is all the, the kingdom plantae. Um, then down here we've got the epistocons, which breaks off into animals and animal-like organisms, and then fungi and, and fungal-like organisms like amoebas. So just thought that was kind of cool. And I also wanted to start, while we're talking about evolution, thinking about the evolution of life here on Earth. Um, there are a lot of theories out there about how life, um, how life started, a lot of different hypotheses. And um, nobody really knows how life on Earth originated. But one potential hypothesis for the origin of life on Earth is that fungal spores or tissues were able to travel to Earth on a comet from a distant galaxy and bring life to Earth. Um, there have been studies that have shown that fungal spores and lichens and other fungal materials can survive the vacuum of space. Um, they can survive the, the radiation um, and can still um, come back to life once they're in a suitable environment. So it is possible that life may have originated elsewhere in the universe and traveled here via fungal spores. Um, yeah, I just thought that was a, kind of an interesting hypothesis. Um, these pictures I'm sharing here are of prototaxites. Um, it's one of the um, largest fossilized fungi um, it, it was living on Earth about 420 million years ago up until uh, about 350 million years ago. And the fossils that people have found um, of this organism are about three feet in diameter and 26 feet tall. They're like trees. Trees, but... <laughs> yeah, they look like trees, but they are actually fungi. Um, and the evidence, so at first when people found these fossils, they thought they were just a really primitive form of a gymnosperm, of like a uh, conifer tree, um, because conifers evolved right around this time too. Right around 400 million years ago is when conifers first started to appear on Earth, maybe like 380 million years ago. But um, further research was done, and they were able to analyze the types of um, molecules present in, in these fossils, the different types of carbon and, and things like that. And they determined that the, um, the structure was made primarily of fungus, and that it also had an, a photosynthetic partner growing in it. So this was basically a giant lichen that was the at one point, the 
largest organism on Earth. Like when it was alive, there was nothing else quite this large um, growing on land, as you can see depicted in, in some of this artwork here. So Prototaxites is just kind of a cool fossil relic, um, and it kind of gives us some insight into a potential pathway for the evolution of our forests. Uh, one theory is that fungi pave the way for plants to develop on land. Um, they created structures that um, algae and cyanobacteria could live inside of and supported these algae as they became more complex and eventually started growing structures similar to the um, primitive plants that we find today, like mosses, ferns, lycopods, um, and that gradually there was this evolutionary shift of the plant components of this, of this symbiotic organism um, dominating the, the aerial portion and the fungal parts kind of dropping down into more of the soil layer um, as those plants started to be able to function more or less on their own. Um, the fungi kind of drop back a little and let the plants take on a more dominant role. Um, so yeah, I find this to be super fascinating. I wish I had a time machine so I could go back and actually know how this worked and how it happened, right? These are all just fun ideas to think about. Um, nobody really knows for sure what happened, but I find this to be incredibly fascinating. Um, and there's evidence that even today, plants cannot survive without fungi. Uh, and that's part of what I'm going to be exploring in my presentation. So a little bit more about the queendom fungi, um, since they, they might not be an official kingdom taxonomically anymore. Um, and since they might be the uh, originators of life on Earth, the great grandmothers of all life as we know it. Um, I like to think of them as the queendom. So, so far, scientists have described about 120,000 different species of fungi. Um, but that's only a small portion of the estimated total to exist. Um, somewhere between 2.2 and 3.8 million species are believed to live here on Earth. Um, most of those fungi do not produce macroscopic fruiting bodies, the things we know of as mushrooms. Um, so here's a picture of a mushroom uh, that I found in Frick Park last April. This is Panis neostragosis. So this is the fruit body of this fungus. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about fungal structure here in a bit. But yeah, so 10 to 12,000 species of Mushroom producing fungi are thought to exist here in North America, and Pennsylvania is believed to be home to at least 3,000 different kinds of mushroom producing fungi. Um, within the, the queendom, there's seven distinct uh, phylum or phyla. Yeah, and um, the, the two big ones are words you've maybe heard before if you've ever been curious about fungi and looked into them. The two main phyla are the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota, or the Ascomycetes and the Basidiomycetes. Um, most of the edible and medicinal fungi um, that we know of fall within those categories. There's also some other groups that you've maybe heard of. Um, there's the chytrids. They're pretty well known for their impacts on amphibians. Um, they can be parasitic on amphibians. Microsporidia is another group. And another of the, the big phyla is glomeromycota. Wow, it even spelled that right. I'm really impressed with these subtitles. <laughs> um, so the glomeromycota are um, mycorrhizal species uh, that are really well studied because of their importance in agriculture. And we'll get into that a little bit later too. So yeah, I was talking about the two large phyla. Um, Ascomycota is the largest phylum within the queendom. Um, I think 50 to 75% of all, all 
um, mushrooms or all fungi are within the ascomycetes. Um, so that includes all lichens and all endophytic fungi. Um, all fungi used in the production of beer, bread, industrial enzymes, and most fermented foods fall within this phylum. Um, so popular edible mushrooms you may be heard of are morels and truffles. Those are both examples of ascomycetes. And in the pictures here, um, this is a species of orbilia. And that's just a small cup fungus. And on the right here is an example of a sinewed ramelina, which is a type of lichen. And then the other big group within the queendom are the basidiomycetes. So when you think about a grocery store mushroom, um, you're thinking about a basidiomycete. So all of the guild mushrooms, like this uh, velvet foot mushroom here, they fall under this group of fungi. Um, but yeah, so other than the common edible and medicinal mushrooms, um, some outcasts in this group include a couple species of lichens, um, yeasts, and uh, some human pathogens, and then also some plant pathogens like rusts and smuts. Um, so yeah, this is the velvet foot mushroom here. And this one, I, I don't know. I found this um, back in December. It's some type of polypore mushroom um, that I've been unable to identify yet. But yeah, polypores are mushrooms that have uh, holes on their fertile surface instead of gills. Um, and next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fungus life cycle just so we can get some of this terminology out there in the open and understood a little bit. Um, so the whole point of a mushroom, it's a fruiting body, it's a reproductive structure. And so its entire purpose is to release spores out into the world so that those spores can find a suitable place to continue the species. Um, so this is an example of a typical basidiomycete life cycle. So any of the um, like portobello mushrooms or most of the mushrooms we're familiar with follow a life cycle similar to this. So their spores are released from the mushroom. Um, they get transported by insects or wind or water. Um, they end up in a suitable environment. The spores then germinate and begin to grow um, a simple mycelium, and uh, once they encounter a, another um, mycelial network from a, a spore that is compatible with them, um, a little side note on that, yes, fungi do have sex um, in this way. This is kind of how they mate, so they have mating types, um, and so they have to find a uh, a compatible mating type here to be able to fuse um, and form a mature mycelium that is um, diploid and then that mycelium can grow, um, you know, absorb nutrients from its environment, store energy, and eventually um, put energy into producing another reproductive structure, um, another mushroom to disperse spores and, and continue continue on. So yeah, that's a little bit about what's going on in the in the life cycle of a fungus. And so these little threads here, these hyphae and mycelium, um, they are microscopic and they grow through um, whatever the, the fungus is digesting. Often it's wood or um, manure or soil, um, and they even grow within living plants and within us. Um, so you've probably got lots of hyphae and mycelium growing through different parts of your body right now 
which is kind of weird to think about, um, but they play an important role in the health of all beings on Earth. And um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the roles they play within a forest ecosystem. Stephen, before you move on real quick, I have um, one question here. Does a single fung fungi blossom have both sex spores? Yeah, so um, they can have multiple mating types. So it's not simply like male-female. There are some species of fungi that have like 20,000 different sexes. Um, and they produce multiple sexes, um, multiple different mating types within that um, single fruiting body. Um, but I would need to look into that more in terms of how that works, like with meiosis, like how do they replicate and, and create those spores? Like, I don't know if they're limited to producing only four. I think they're limited to maybe only producing four or eight different mating types per fruiting body. Just trying to think about how, how cell division would work. But maybe they can produce more. I'm not sure. That is a great question. Cool. Thanks. All right. So fungi um, have a lot of different roles in a forest ecosystem. The three main uh, roles you can think of them in are saprotrophs, so breaking down dead organic material, biotrophs and necrotrophs. These are the parasitic fungi um, that are balancing ecosystems. And then there are uh, symbiotic fungi. So most of these are mycorrhizal or endophytic fungi. Um, living in association with the trees and other plants in the forest. Um, just to break down some of these words a little bit, um, so troph means to gain nourishment from. Um, so if you just think about that, and then sapro means dead or decaying, so to gain nourishment from dead or decaying material, that's what that word means. And then uh, necrotroph is to gain nourishment from a corpse, and biotrophs to gain nourishment from something that's living. So biotrophs are things like um, a lot of plant pathogens like rusts, um, like downy mildew or powdery mildew. Um, so they affect living things, um, but the fungus needs their host to stay living in order for it to live. Um, whereas necrotrophs are things like this cordyceps uh, that's pictured here it will kill its host um, and then fruit and produce spores. So I'm going to start off by going into the saprotrophs and talking a little bit about wood decomposition. Um, so there's two really unique ways that fungi can decompose wood. And in fact, before I get into that, I wanted to present an interesting um, hypothesis that is out there for um, the creation of coal here on Earth. So up until 2016, the most widely supported hypothesis for the creation of coal during the Carboniferous period was that white rot fungi had yet to evolve. Um, so fossil evidence puts their evolution at dating to um, right around 300 million years ago, right at the end of the Carboniferous period. Um, and so for the longest time, people thought that, well, there just wasn't anything to break down woody material. Um, so woody trees have cellulose and lignin that make them strong. Uh, and those compounds are really hard to break down. They're really dense molecules. And um, yeah, so people just thought that, well, there was nothing to break down the woody material. And so it just accumulated over 60 million years and uh, got buried, and that's how we ended up with coal. Um, but in 2016, some researchers put out a paper proposing um, that there was evidence of decomposition in woody material prior to the evolution of white rot fungi. 
uh, and that a more plausible hypothesis was that the tropical and wet conditions at the time um, and some geological events created these huge um, peatlands that then got buried and produced the coal that we have today. So um, you might find that still in a lot of books. I, there's still a National Geographic article I was looking at that was like, white rot fungi are the reason we'll never have coal again um, in the history of Earth. But I think um, that it could, it could be possible for there to be another geologic event that would produce coal. Um, yeah, and just an interesting coincidence in the timing of evolution and those geologic events. So yeah, brown rot fungi and white rot fungi are two ways that um, fungi can decompose wood. So in brown rot fungi, the fungus excretes enzymes and acids that can degrade the cellulose molecules of the wood. Um, and it leaves the lignin behind. And lignin is kind of brown in color, and it, um, it leaves this kind of square or cubical structure behind as the cellulose is decomposed. So the lignin is kind of that really rigid stuff that makes wood um, what, it, what it is, like makes it really tough, really hard. Um, white rot fungi, on the other hand, degrade that lignin. And so um, they leave the cellulose behind, which is this white colored stuff that you see here. So that's, um, and this wood is really soft and um, yeah, it almost looks bleached compared to like how, how wood normally looks. So those are two ways that decomposition can happen in woody material. Um, but beyond fungi's role in just decomposing wood. Um, they decompose a number of other things, and some are so specialized in their decomposition uh, habits that they are confined to very specific materials. So I wanted to highlight a couple species of fungi that grow around here that have become specialized saprotrophs. Um, so this is an interesting um, tiny white mushroom that you might find if you are out in a forest with cucumber magnolia trees. Um, this, this mushroom, Strobilurus caniginoides, I find most often growing on the cones of cucumber magnolia trees. So uh, it doesn't grow on any of the ornamental magnolias. Uh, it's believed to only grow on the magnolias native to eastern North America. But I find it most often under cucumber magnolia. Here's another example. This is beech woodwort or Hypoxylon fragiformi, and it only grows on American beech trees. So it's this tiny um, red, it kind of almost looks like a thimble, um, little warts growing on dead beech wood. Um, so a really important decomposer for breaking down uh, fallen, fallen beech trees. And then one more specialist I wanted to share is the walnut mycena. So this one is a little bit more uh, of a generalist than the other ones. It grows on the husks or shells of all members of the Juglandaceae. So that's all of the walnuts and hickories that grow around here. Um, you can find this mushroom in the fall underneath them growing on the remains of previous year's nuts. So this little mushroom gets in there and starts breaking down those shells uh, and turning them back into um, the, the nutrients that the trees then reabsorb from the soil. So decomposition are super important role that fungi play in our ecosystem, recycling nutrients and allowing plants to, um, to absorb carbon, nitrogen, and other important growing materials from the, the detritus that the forest creates. So yeah. All right, now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and 
explore the role of parasitism. So earlier I was talking a little bit about necrotrophic and biotrophic fungi. So um, insect consuming fungi, I think are what people often think about when they hear about a parasitic fungus. Um, all, all animals and plants and even other fungi can be the host of a parasitic fungus. On the left here, this is a Bouveria species that I found uh, growing on this caterpillar. And on the right here, this is mayapple rust growing on mayapples. So if you've ever been for a walk through our forests in May or June and you've seen these little umbrella looking plants on the forest floor that look like they came out of a Dr. Seuss book, that's a mayapple. And if you turn over a number of these plants, you'll eventually find this bright orange um, rust that is growing on their underside. Pretty cool little rust fungus. So yeah, uh, and it, when it comes to parasitic fungi, um, they don't often uh, get portrayed in a positive light because they can be pretty destructive. And in fact, from a forest, forester's perspective, um, parasitic fungi are generally considered bad because they kill trees. Um, but if you keep in mind that a forester's job is to grow mature trees for harvest and profit, um, then yeah, you can understand why they might think parasitic fungi are bad. They're impacting uh, their ability to produce mature trees for lumber harvesting. From an ecological perspective, parasitic fungi maintain balance. Uh, they tend to be most abundant when one species is dominant, and they create natural disturbances that increase the biodiversity of an ecosystem. That said, um, unfortunately, when parasitic fungi get the most attention, it's usually when they are introduced to a new environment and the natural balances that would be in place normally um, are just not there. So I've got some examples of some introduced parasitic fungi that have drastically shaped the forests of Pittsburgh. The first one I wanted to talk about is the American chestnut and chestnut blight. So chestnut blight, uh, Cryphonectria parasitica is an ascomycete fungus that has totally changed the character of forests in eastern North America. Um, since its introduction, it has killed an estimated 4 billion American chestnut trees. Um, and American chestnut trees formerly made up about 25% of all trees in the eastern U.S. Um, so this fungus, got a picture of it here. Um, it was introduced to New York City in the early 1900s, and it was introduced from Southeast Asia. Um, I think they were bringing Japanese chestnut trees over for uh, production, um, looking at like, could these other chestnut trees produce more or like better um, nuts? Um, and the unintended consequences of bringing over those Japanese chestnut trees was that they brought a fungal pathogen with them. Um, so from the early 1900s on, this pathogen spread rapidly throughout uh, the eastern U.S. You can see here this is the natural range of the American chestnut. Um, and so we were kind of right here in the heart of the chestnut's natural range, and um, chestnut trees were wiped out here in Pittsburgh by about 1940. So within a span of 40 years, it had spread from New York City all the way down into West Virginia, um, and it was probably um, down here into Alabama and Mississippi by about 1970, I think. Um, so, this fungus um, causes uh, the it causes these cankers in the in the bark of the tree, 
and it mostly kills the trees by producing oxalic acid, which reduced the pH of the vascular tissue and kill those cells, and it um, eventually girdles the tree, preventing the tree from transporting water up to its leaves, um, and then it uh, dies. So yeah, the loss of the American chestnut was a huge, huge event in terms of the ecology of our forests. Um, there are a lot of species that depend on the chestnut tree for its nuts. Um, there are a lot of insects that relied on this tree as a host tree. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty sad thinking about it. Um, in this last picture, so I, I took this picture. This is an American chestnut tree I found growing here in Pennsylvania. And it's not often that I see them. I spend a lot of my time hiking, backpacking, and um, anytime I see an American chestnut, I'm just amazed that they're still able to, to continue on despite this um, persistent pathogen, pathogen in our ecosystem. Um, so yeah, it doesn't ever kill the roots of the tree. It just kills the aerial parts. So the root systems are still there and they're able to re-sprout. Um, but the trees don't often reach maturity, and if they do reach maturity, they die shortly thereafter. But there is some good news. There's some research being done, um, some development of transgenic American chestnut trees. They've um, inserted a gene from wheat, I think, um, that makes them resistant to this pathogen. And so between that and some breeding programs and uh, some, some search for just naturally resistant trees, there is hope that this um, majestic tree can be reintroduced to our forest ecosystems. It was known as the redwood of the east. It was the largest growing tree around here in terms of diameter. Um, and so it would be really awesome to see this tree restored to our forests. All right, one more sad story, and then we'll get into some more lighthearted stuff again. Um, <laughs> this just comes with the territory. Uh, when Kari asked me to put together something on fungi, I was like, well, if it's the story of Pittsburgh's forests. Fungi have played a really critical role in shaping our forests, and unfortunately, part of that is a very negative role in the case of these um, introduced species. So here's another example, the American elm and Dutch elm disease. Uh, by the way, it's called Dutch elm disease because the scientists who discovered it were Dutch. Um, and it was discovered in Europe in the 1920s. Um, yeah, but it originated, I think, also in, in Southeast Asia, um, similar to uh, chestnut blight. So Dutch elm disease is caused by a species of fungus called Ophiostoma. That's the genus. There's believed to be three different species of fungi that are contributing to Dutch elm disease um, throughout the world. It's a problem in Europe, and it's a problem here in North America. Um, and it's a little different in both places um, because there's different species of trees and different species of fungal pathogens. Um, but here in North America, it was um, it was brought over in like the mid 1900s. Um, like, oh wait, it was first identified in 1930 in Ohio, um, and it reached the West Coast by 1973. And over the course of that spread, about 40 million American elm trees were. Um, killed by this disease. Unlike with the American chestnut, though, I feel like a number of American elms um, show some resistance to this disease. Um, it spreads in a little bit of a different way, and it progresses a little differently than chestnut blight. So Dutch elm disease is a vascular wilt disease. So when the fungus enters the tree, uh, it basically gums up their their vascular system. It just produces a ton of spores and, and hyphae that grow through their, their xylem. 
and restrict flow of water up to the leaves. So you can see here on the right side of this tree, there's a bunch of really barren branches that have no leaves on it. Um, that's a really characteristic symptom of this disease in elm trees. You find a lot of wilted leaves, um, entire branches that are just totally wilted and, and brown. Um, yeah. But um, if anybody, I just wanted to mention if anybody's interested in seeing a like fully mature American elm tree, there is one right by the Frick Environmental Center. Um, if you go to the Environmental Center and start heading down uh, South Clayton Trail, right as the trail goes from, no, right, um, what's a way, good way to describe it? There's like a, right as you head down the trail, almost immediately getting into the woods, there's another trail that is a sharp right turn. Um, and right at that intersection, there's a really big, super straight tree that has this like really spongy bark, which is characteristic of American elms. And there's a really big, it's kind of been suffering the past couple years, which I'm not sure if it has gotten some kind of infection or if that's just been like the, the weather has been rough on it, but it's been having a little bit of trouble lately, but there's a nice big example of an American elm right there. It's really, really nice. Hmm. Yeah, we should we should check on it because um, Dutch elm disease is seeing a bit of a resurgence. Like mm. as American elm populations are starting to rebound, so uh, the fungus doesn't impact this tree as intensely as as chestnut blight. Um, so a lot of elms are still able to survive to maturity and reproduce, um, and so. We're seeing a little bit of recovery of American elms throughout North America, and along with that, a little bit of resurgence of this um, disease. So it is still out there. It is still impacting trees. Um, and yeah, part of how it impacts trees is it gets spread by these beetles. So elm bark beetles, um, there's a a species that's native to North America, that's the genus Hylergopinus. <laughs> um, I think I'm pronouncing that somewhat right. So th that's the native elm bark beetle. Um, Scol Scol Scolitis is the European uh, elm bark beetle, and it was introduced to North America, and it's a little bit more effective at, at spreading the fungus. Um, so that, that plays a part in the spread of this disease as well. That said, there are a lot of um, elms that are resistant to this fungus. Um, there's some breeding programs, and you can get from nurseries some uh, cultivars that are pretty resistant to this disease. So there are cultivars out there you can buy. Um, if you're really set on having an American elm tree in your yard, um, definitely want to make sure you're getting one that's resistant to Dutch elm disease. Um, but yeah, I think also with this one, there is some hope that um, with, with monitoring and with control, um, we can really reduce the impact of Dutch elm disease and um, help restore elms to our forests. When the disease is first detected in trees, it is possible to remove the infection through pruning and the use of fungicides. So it's a little bit more manageable than some of the other diseases that are out there. All right. Um, so yeah, next I wanted to share an example of what does a parasitic relationship between native species look like, um, between a native fungus species and native tree species. Um, just to give you a sense of a, a more balanced parasitic relationship um, and to be able to begin to see maybe the value of these types of fungi in our ecosystem. So here is Armillaria melia, uh, the honey mushroom. And there's about 12 different species in the genus Armillaria that look pretty similar 
um, that grow throughout North America. We have at least six species here in our region um, that, that look pretty similar to this. And this is a um, necrotroph and saprotroph. So it will parasitize living trees and eventually kill them. Um, but it will then also decompose that woody material. Um, it doesn't immediately leave that host. Um, like it, it's able to continue growing even on um, dead material. And this fungus um, can cause a lot of damage in our forests. It, it can really wipe out a lot of trees. But it also has some natural... Um, natural enemies is the word I want to say, <laughs> um, but that's not quite right. But there are some things that also parasitize this mushroom and help keep it um, balanced. And if you think about the role it's playing in this ecosystem, um, it helps create disturbances that allow new species to take hold. So if a uh, oak forest reached its climax and all of the trees stood tall and lived for 500 years, that, that would be a great thing, right? We'd love to see old trees, huge trees, um, but they start to taper off in their ability to provide services to the ecosystem. Um, and it's important that there's turnover and recycling of nutrients and space for other species to come in. Um, so that's where this fungus comes in. It uh, kind of clears room and uh, makes space for new species. And this is the species that parasitizes it uh, and balances that out. So this is Entoloma abortivum, the aborted Entoloma, and it thrives on all different kinds of honey mushrooms. So it finds those fungi and uh, attacks the developing fruit bodies of them and turns them into these weird um, blob-like things that you might find in August or September on a walk in Frick Park or in other parks here in Pittsburgh. Um, and it is commonly also known as shrimp of the woods, although I'm not entirely sure why. I guess some people think it tastes like shrimp. Um, so yeah, a cool um, parasitic mushroom that attacks another fungus and helps maintain balance in our ecosystem. And I think we're at the 45-minute mark here, Karia, if we wanted to take yeah. a little break. I was just going to suggest that. So um, we'll take a 10-minute break, uh, and we'll be back at 1.58. So, um, and while the break is happening, Stephen, there were a couple of questions that I was going to ask. Um, and, I'll, and for anybody who wants the, you know, is like not taking a break because they want to stick around for the questions, I'll post all the answers to the questions in the chat. So if you'd like to go take the break, go right ahead. Um, you won't miss it. I'll put it all in the chat. So the parasitic fungi, we looked at some examples of introduced fungi that um, are attacking native tree species. We looked at an example of a native fungus that was that attacks native tree species. And then we looked at a fungus that attacks the fungus that attacks the native trees. Um, <laughs> so next I wanted to share a little bit about an invasive insect species and how parasitic fungi could be the key to managing this threat to our forests. So if you've been paying attention to the news at all in the past year, at some point or another, you've probably heard the words spotted lanternfly talked about, especially if you pay attention to like the environmental section of the news at all. Um, this insect has caught quite a lot of attention in the past year or two. Um, it is native to parts of Asia and was introduced to the United States and first discovered here in Pennsylvania in Berks County in 2014. So this is a pretty recent introduction and this insect is a huge threat to um, our, our fruit industries here in Pennsylvania and also to um, 
to the to the grape industry, but they can also attack um, sapling trees and be a big issue for nurseries. Um, and there are some hardwood trees that they will attack as well. To date, there have only been um, deaths associated with spotted lanternfly in sapling trees, sumac, grapevines, and tree of heaven. Um, and tree of heaven is an invasive tree species, so we're not too worried about that one. Um, but the fact that it can impact these sapling trees um, and, and some of our other native species is definitely a concern. Um, and another thing I was learning about spotted lanternfly is in terms of native hardwood trees in our forest, its preferred hosts are black walnut and maple trees. And so it'll cause some pretty serious um, defoliation in those trees. Um, this insect will feed on the sap of that tree and just basically reduce the tree's ability to, um, to transport water and sugars to the parts that need them. Um, and the tree will decline, but um, there, like I said, no, no deaths have been documented among our, our native hardwood trees um, in regards to this insect species. So, um, like I said, there is hope thanks to Bouveria bassiana and Batcoa major, um, two native uh, fungi that live in the soil here that have been found parasitizing this insect. Um, so pretty cool to, to see that um, the answer to an introduced insect species could be just one of our native fungi um, finding a new host. Um, so researchers have been doing studies on these fungi. Um, this is from a researcher at Cornell University. There was a study done there in 2019, I think. And then they collaborated with some folks at Penn State last year um, doing uh, some trials, spraying the spores of this fungi um, onto clusters of, of this insect. And they found that it was, it reduced populations by about 50%. Um, so not 100% effective, but anything that slows down this insect, I think is probably worth exploring and investigating, especially if, um, it can be something that's just a natural part of our ecosystem that doesn't pose a threat to other parts of, of our ecosystem, right? This isn't a toxic chemical that we're spraying that is gonna impact birds and other insects. Um, this is just a natural thing um, that we're taking advantage of and, and using to help manage this insect. So, Fungal biopesticides, I believe, are going to be the answer to um, a lot of our issues around invasive insects and other such pests. Um, if we're able to develop strains that specialize on a particular species, um, hopefully they would pose a, a limited threat to non-target insects. So that wraps up our section on parasitism. All right, the last section I wanted to get into here is really exploring this idea of mutualism and the roles that fungi can play in forest health. Can I ask one question about parasitism before you move on? Sure. Okay. Um, there was a question. I think I know the answer to it, but I wanted to just ask you. Um, this is from uh, Riva. Insects move around, so how do the fungi entrap them? Ah, yeah, so how that works is the fungal spores will end up on the, the exoskeleton of the insect, and if they land in a place where they're able to get through the exoskeleton, um, so often it's like in natural openings in the insect's body, um, or at like joints, or wounds, or things like that, um, then the, the spore can germinate and reach the interior of the insect where it can 
grow, um, get the nutrients it needs, and then um, eventually kill its host and produce fruiting bodies um, to spread to other insects. So yeah, um, the insect would have to make contact with that spore in some way, either directly, um, so like if some insects are infected, they might bump into each other, or like a living one might crawl over a dead one. Um, wind can blow the spores around. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, there, there's some fungi that are able to sort of take control of an insect and um, get it to exhibit certain behaviors that make it more likely to spread spores to other insects. Um, an example of one that's like native to here. Um, you've also maybe seen in the news that there's going to be another um, periodical cicada emergence um, in our in our region, and um, there's a fungus that is parasitic on those periodical cicadas called Massospora, and it will infect um, individuals, like it'll infect males, and the males that are infected once they have a, um, basically what happens is the abdomen of the insect falls off and reveals just a white spore mass in, in place of their abdomen. And um, it'll, the fungus causes the males to fly around and give the same signal that a female um, cicada would give. And so it, this lures other um, cicadas, like male cicadas that aren't infected over to this infected male cicada and um, since they're reproducing uh, the males will like go to like engage in reproduction with this infected male um, and get spores on them and then those spores will infect that cicada. So yeah the, the fungi are pretty creative in, in terms of how they get around and, and spread. Great question. All right, out of that tangent, um, back to mutualism. All right, so there's a couple different things in terms of mutualism that I wanted to explore um, with you all. So the first one here, this is probably the most um, well-known example of how fungi live um, mutualistically with plants, and that is through mycorrhizae. Um, which means fungus roots. So there's over 6,000 different species of fungi that create this type of relationship with over 90% of the world's plants. Um, fungi expand the absorptive area of plant roots 10 to 1,000 times. So they'll grow in association with roots um, and the fungus is able to um, find minerals in the soil and efficiently um, dissolve them using enzymes and organic acids that it secretes um, so it can find things like phosphorus in the soil and transport that through its um, threads to the roots of the plant um, and basically just improve the efficiency of that plant in obtaining water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients. So the plant will trade its sugars to the fungus for minerals from the soil. Um, the plant, you know, its leaves are photosynthesizing and producing lots of sugars, so it's got plenty of sugar to spare, and it's happy to trade those sugars for these hard-to-get um, minerals and other nutrients from the soil. So the, these fungi produce unique digestive enzymes that unlock nutrients that would otherwise be unavailable to plants. And um, this diagram here outlines some of the benefits of uh, arbuscular endomycorrhizae. So that's one specific type of mycorrhizal association. There's, I think, seven different types of um, mycorrhizal relationships. Um, so AM, that stands for arbuscular mycorrhizal. Um, some of the other ones that trees will develop 
include Eric Cohen mycorrhizal relationships. Um, so anything in the Ericaceae family um, that has a mycorrhizal partner, this is often what they develop. So things like um, blueberries um, and, and cranberries, they're in the, in the Ericaceae family and they will have this type of mycorrhizal association. Another one is called monotropoid, um, and this is a specific mycorrhizal association formed between um, the plants in the genus monotropa. So if you've ever seen ghost pipe or ice plant, um, uh, it's a small white plant that grows in the forest that is a, believed to be a parasitic plant um, because it doesn't produce uh, leaves that photosynthesize, so it has to get its energy from somewhere else, um, and it gets its energy through this mycorrhizal association. Um, and then the, the last type that's really important to forests, and arguably one of the most important um, fungal relationships in terms of forest health, are the ectomycorrhiza. Um, yeah. Interesting thing, though, about uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae is that there's only about 169 species of fungi that um, can produce that type of relationship, but they do so with about 85% of all plants on Earth, um, and that includes about 90% of vascular plants. So they're small in number, but they are ubiquitous. They form relationships with almost any plant that they can. Um, and that is in stark contrast to the ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, of which there are about five or 6,000 species, um, but they form um, relationships with only about 5% of land plants. So it's kind of the flip of the coin here, like, um, two sides of the same coin, like the ectomycorrhizal fungi are incredibly diverse, but they're limited to um, mostly partnering with um, trees. So these are really common fungi in our forests. Um, they evolved about 250 million years ago, and they provide all sorts of benefits to our, our forest um, trees. They provide antiparasitic benefits fighting off fungal and bacterial diseases that attack the roots, um, and a whole host of other benefits as well. Um, so an interesting thing about these ectomycorrhizal fungi is that they can be specialists or generalists. They can associate with anywhere from one to 20 or more different species of plants. And trees, uh, the trees that they associate with also form a range of relationships. Um, I was reading that Norway spruce trees have been documented in relationship with over a hundred different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi at one time. Um, and that the relationships that they have change over time as well. So a species of tree, maybe when it's a sapling, might be in relationship with um, you know, one or two or three um, species of ectomycorrhizae, and then as it grows, it might exit those relationships and form relationships with new species of ectomycorrhizae. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty complex, um, but yeah, there, there isn't like a simple way of thinking about this where it's like, oh, this species always pairs with this one for its entire life, and this is how it goes. It's a lot of ebb and flow and change. Um, and we're still discovering a lot about these relationships. So in this picture is a Rusula mushroom um, emerging from a nice bed of sphagnum moss. Uh, the Rusulas are one of the larger groups of ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, if you've ever seen a bright red and white mushroom um, in the forest, that's a pretty common Rusula mushroom. Um, yeah, but I've got a couple examples I wanted to share of species you might encounter in our forest um, that are examples of both generalists and specialists in terms of the relationship they form with trees. Uh, so the first one here 
This is Amanita muscaria, um, our, our local variety. So this is a, a species that grows throughout um, Europe, Northern Asia, and North America. Um, and there's a couple different varieties. The popular culture variety is um, like a deep red color with white warts. It's like the mushroom that inspired um, the mushroom in Mario, right? It's like the most iconic mushroom on earth. Um, so our local variety is this kind of yellow orange color. It's the yellow American fly agaric. And this is probably the most generalist ectomycorrhizal mushroom in our area. It associates with a ton of different types of trees um, including pines, spruces, firs, birches, and aspens. So it, um, it'll form a partnership with almost any tree um, that it can, it seems like. It's pretty open. Um, here's another species. This is the painted Suillus, Suillus spragii. This one's interesting. Uh, this is in the Bolete family, so if you've ever eaten a porcini mushroom, um, you've eaten a not-too-distant relative of this species. You can see here it's got this pore surface on the underside, so instead of having gills like a portobello mushroom, it's got all these tiny pores, but it's got a stem and it grows from the soil, um, so that makes it a, a Bolete, so the the Bolitaceae is a big family of mushrooms, a lot of really delicious edible mushrooms, a lot of mediocre edible mushrooms, and a couple of mushrooms that'll make you sick. <laughs> um, but yeah, this uh, painted Suillus, really beautiful mushroom, and it only grows in association with eastern white pine. Um, and another interesting thing about this one is that it is has yet to be documented from a pine plantation. So it's only found growing in natural eastern white pine forests, which I think is interesting. I wonder what it is about that natural um, forest community that supports the growth of this mushroom compared to a pine plantation. All right, last example of an ectomycorrhizal fungus this is another pretty popular edible mushroom that you may have heard of before. Or if you're a foodie, maybe you've heard of chanterelles. Um, incredibly popular in the West, um, you know, California, Oregon, Washington. They, they have tons of chanterelle mushrooms out there, um, fall through winter, pretty popular edible mushroom. Around here, they grow really abundantly when, whenever we have a wet summer. This past summer was pretty dry, so not, not much chanterelle production around here. Um, but yeah, chanterelles, are, there's two different genera within the chanterelles, cantharellus and craterellus. So on the left here, this is a smooth chanterelle, uh, cantharellus latericius, and on the right here, I think this one's called a flame chanterelle. This is Craterellus ignicolor. Um, and chanterelles are interesting because there's about a dozen morphologically distinct species, but it's believed that there's many cryptic species hidden in that. So if you start doing DNA analysis on these mushrooms, um, researchers are finding that mushrooms that look identical um, to the naked eye are actually quite distinct um, genetically. And so there's believed to be over 20 species of chanterelle that grow here in Pennsylvania. And um, they are mycorrhizal with oak trees and beech trees. And that made me wonder if they might be mycorrhizal with everything in the Phagaceae. Um, so the Phagaceae is the family of trees that beech belongs to, that oak belongs to, and also that American chestnut belongs to. So I, I tried to do some research on this. There was a paper that I was trying to access, but I think I had to pay $30 to read it that had a list of mycorrhizal fungi associated with 
American chestnut. Um, and I had bet that chanterelles would be on that list. They seem to be pretty open to partnering with any trees in the Phagaceae. All right, so mycorrhizal associations are incredible. They connect trees of all different species. Um, they allow trees to share nutrients, um, to communicate with one another, um, and to survive a lot of different diseases. Um, but there's a whole world to be explored in endophytic and um, epiphytic fungi. So this is a picture of witch hazel. I just picked a, a random picture I had of a, a tree with leaves on it because literally every tree has endophytic fungi growing inside its tissues, whether they're inside the leaf tissue, um, within the bark, or within the roots. Um, there have been endophytes documented in at least 95% of all major plant lineages, including liverworts and mosses and horsetails and ferns, even the, the really um, prehistoric plants. Um, so endophytic fungi are a whole can of worms that I don't even know <laughs> entirely how to get into with just um, the time that we have today. Um, a little of what I can share, though, is um, some interesting things about them. So they can be spread um, between plants through their seeds. So they're able to um, contain either a bit of the mycelium or some spores within the seed and be present in the offspring of a plant um, without having to be reintroduced, which is a totally unique thing um, to this group of fungi. Um, most of the other fungal associations have to happen once a plant starts to grow. Um, this one is kind of there from birth. Um, if you think about uh, germination being kind of like the birth of a plant, um, kind of cool. Uh, so these fungi pass on all different kinds of benefits, including drought tolerance, disease resistance, uh, and in one really interesting study, um, researchers were able to remove the endophytic fungi from grasses that were growing in geothermic soils near Lawson Volcanic and Yellowstone National Parks, and they took those endophytic fungi and put them in tomato plants, watermelon plants, and wheat plants, and planted them in soil that was 149 degrees Fahrenheit. And these plants with their endophytic partners were able to survive 10 days in soil that was 149 degrees. But in trials where they grew those plants separately from the endophytes, and they also cultured the endophytes and put them in soil that was um, hot, they could not live in soil that was over 104 degrees. So on their own, they couldn't pass 104, but together, they were able to survive soil that was 149 degrees. So I, I feel like that was just a really illustrative example of the immense benefits that endophytic fungi can pass on to their, their plant partners and that their plant partners can pass on to them. So there's incredibly complex things that happen once you get into these symbiotic partnerships. You can't really look at them as these two separate things that are trading benefits back and forth to each other because there's a whole new set of properties that emerges um, when you're in a relationship like this. And then a uh, uh, quick footnote on epiphytic fungi. These are fungi that live on the surfaces of plants. Um, and it's believed that the most um, typical reason for this is <laughs> this head start theory that um, if fungi can colonize the surface of a plant, whenever that plant dies, they then are the first one on the scene to begin the decomposition process. Um, so most epiphytes, epiphytic fungi live on the surface without any symptoms for the entire life of a plant. And then all of a sudden when the plant dies, a signal is triggered and they begin decomposing that plant material. Um, but sometimes if a plant is diseased, 
it can cause the epiphytic fungi to um, become activated and uh, exhibit um, symptoms of disease in a plant, which I find kind of interesting. But yeah, we could probably talk about this for days, but that's about all I feel comfortable presenting on it. <laughs> so another example of symbiosis of mutualism in our forest ecosystems involving fungi are lichens. Lichens are incredibly complex. We could probably teach a whole class just on lichens, right? You're in this story of Pittsburgh's forests. We could probably do the same thing, story of Pittsburgh's lichens. Um, and we'd still have stuff to cover, right? Um, so there's three ways to think about what a lichen is. The traditional way of thinking about lichens is this reductionist view of reducing them to their parts. So a lichen is composed of an alga or a cyanobacterium and its fungal partner. Um, but we can move beyond that to other ways of thinking about lichens. So a mycocentric definition uh, that centers the fungal perspective would be that a lichen represents a fungus who has discovered agriculture. Um, so it provides the, the fungus provides the perfect environment for their photosynthetic partner. Um, it basically is constructing a greenhouse where this algae can thrive, be protected from the sun. There's um, sunscreen-like um, molecules that lichens will create to protect their partner from the intense ultraviolet radiation. Um, and the fungus keeps that alga um, nice and damp, keeps it from drying out, um, takes care of it in exchange for all the sugars that the algae produces. Um, and then the last way of thinking about it is just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the system's perspective. That a lichen is an ecosystem, it's an emergent property entirely different than the sum of its parts, and that interactions between the partners create miniature ecosystems regulating temperature, humidity, um, gas levels, light, and all that fun stuff. So lichens provide a ton of benefits to the forest. They provide um, anti-herbivory chemicals that protect the lichen and their substrate. Um, and probably the most interesting thing about lichens is they contribute up to 50% of the usable nitrogen in forest ecosystems. In the Pacific Northwest, studies have shown that lichens are able to fix nitrogen um, from the atmosphere and provide 50% of the nitrogen budget of that ecosystem. Um, so yeah, lichens support uh, the food web as well. Um, they're food for mammals as large as caribous, as well as numerous insects and invertebrates and they're important nesting material for birds. And here's my photo credits. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I realize we're running out of time here. So it was a little abrupt. Right. Uh, I, I wrote down uh, a bunch of questions that came up in the chat in the second half um, that it just didn't quite seem like there would be time to get to just now. So. Uh, I was thinking I might email them to you and see if you could just write a, a brief answer to some of them and uh, and then I'll email them out to everybody and I'll probably email out the chat transcript as well. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, email out the chat chat transcript because I answered um, a few questions that were just like privately sent as well. So um, so that folks can get those questions as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. This was fantastic, wonderful. Oh, so good. And yeah, um, so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all for being here. It was really fascinating. Thank you so much. And uh, next week, I think I'm going to combine um, wildflowers and touch a little bit on some common invasive plants in the parks and why we why we pay attention to them. Um, so, and I'm you know, I have a tendency to want to talk about everything. Uh, there's just there's so many things I should do 
uh, story of Pittsburgh's forests part two, where we can cover moss and mammals, all the M's, moss, mammals, my Um <laughs> And, uh, um, but yeah, so we'll do, we'll do a lot of plants next week um, for our final, our final one. This five weeks have flown. So um, yeah. Thanks everybody. And I will, I'll send out that email and then I'll see you all next week.